Ah, perfect. Okay, thank you. Okay, so brown marmorated stink bugs. They, uh, they are definitely an issue. How many of you have them or know of them in your buildings or home? <laughs> okay. okay, very good. Uh, they are a pest on many levels, and uh, they are, they're, they're one of the most serious pests that we've gotten into California. And I'll talk all about their spread and, and what they're doing and how we're trying to control them. So they're Haliomorpha halix is the species name. And the, um, the tree on the left is a Chinese pistache. And you can kind of make out on the lower left, you can make out 13th Street a little bit. Um, that is where this tree is. It's at the train station there between R and, let's see, 13th R and Q. Uh, pretty close to here. That was kind of like the epicenter where it all began, the center of everything. In 2013, in September, they were found as a large population already. It's not like somebody just found them at the beginning of the infestation. They've been there for many years because uh, they take a long time to spread. And you can see the branch, you know, the close-up on the right, uh, Baldo Villegas, with, who used to be with California Department of Food and Agriculture, took these shots. He was the first to identify them. Uh, they are native to East Asia. I don't know what happened to my bullets there, but uh, China, Japan, uh, Korea, Taiwan, they are a crop pest in its native range and here, but they are not as bad of a crop pest in those countries as they are here, and I'll explain why. Uh, they were first found in Allentown, Pennsylvania in 1996, and they were identified. It took them a long time to identify them. Uh, in 2001, they were identified. And then it became a serious, serious multi-million dollar pest in 2010 of fruits and vegetables. Um, they are a household nuisance as well as a crop pest and the, uh, in the fall, late summer through fall and winter, as you all know. They, their host list currently includes over 170 species, and that's all kinds of different types of plants and it's likely to rise. It is rising. In fact, as they spread through California, we're identifying species that weren't on the list. I identified three because we have plants here that they don't back east. So this is the adult. You can see up there it's about a foot long. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's a close-up. Uh, the adult is on top, the mature nymph on the bottom. And uh, I want you to notice in the upper right the smooth shoulder edges. Um, you all know what they look like, but, but there's, a, there's some other stink bugs that look very similar, and so this distinguishes them. These have the smooth shoulders. They have the banded abdominal edge that extends beyond the wings. Um, they have, over on the left, two white bands on the antennae, and they're especially distinguishable. Well, let's see. Then the banded legs, the white bands on the legs are especially distinguishable with the nymphs. They're the young. Um, and then once they get to be an adult, they're hard to find those little white bands on the legs. And then they have a rust color. Um, and they're called brown, marmorated, stink bug. Marmorated means marble colored. So they're brown, marble colored, stink bugs. Kind of creative, huh? Not very creative, actually. <laughs> they have uh, clusters of eggs, of generally 28 eggs in a cluster. And the row uh, laid sort of in rows, but kind of a clump also. And you can see over on the right are the young, the first instar nymphs. Those are the first things that come out. They feed on the eggs, on the liquid in the eggs. Uh, and you'll see, have you, anybody ever seen these clusters, the eggs with the clustered around? OK. Now you'll know what to look for. And I'll show you some more examples of them. Uh, then the lower left is the nymph. Uh, last a third instar of five, so they molt between the instars, and they become bigger with each molt. And then the adults on the lower right. On the left is one that's often confused with it. It's a rough stink bug, which is not much of a pest. It's more of a, actually a beneficial insect. It does eat pest insects. And then the stink bug on the right, the brown marmorated stink bug. The difference? And this is a little detail you probably don't need to know about if you're not uh, in the field or you know, studying them. But the rough stink bug have pointed um, uh, end of the head, and the, uh, whereas the brown armored stink bug has a blunt head. 
And then the smooth shoulder versus the rough shoulder, that's why they call it rough stoop butt, because it has rough shoulders. Otherwise, they're virtually identical. And now I can just look at it and say, oh, there's a brown one, a, a rough stink bug. Um, but it took a while to get to that point. Another one is a common crop pest, conspurse stink bug. It's just much smaller, so you can tell them apart that way. But notice the bands on the antennae look not quite so distinguishable, but they're there. Um, you don't really have the bands on the back on the sides of the abdomen. <coughs> and it's smaller. That's the key. Okay. This is what they look like then. They start out with the first instar nymphs up in the upper right, which aren't shown in this diagram here. So you go from the second, third, fourth, and then the fifth, the last, and then you get to the adult, with the male being slightly smaller than the female. Um, and then, so we can, I've got my assistant trained where he actually can, uh, he can see it flying, he can tell if it's a male or female, just from the size. But there's another way you turn it over and look at the um, uh, anatomy and you can see. There's nothing, there's no structure to see, it's just the male has a hole on the end, the female doesn't, which sounds contradictory. Okay, I won't go any further with that. Um, they, <laughs> They overwinter as adults in sheltered areas, as you know, uh, in tree crevices, homes, buildings, barns, other structures. Each adult lives about six to eight months. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's the generation that is born and is hatched last that's the one that overwinters. Uh, the female lays about 250 eggs and uh, most total mates multiple times. Uh, that's our problem <laughs> with so many of them. Each female can lay up to nine egg clusters, and there are one to two generations in the mid-Atlantic states where they came from, um, and my, my task was to see how many there were here. This is the current distribution, and the red, if you look at the bottom left, severe agriculture and nuisance problems reported. And this has spread down to now Tennessee and um, North Carolina and Virginia, where it was uh, more north from there, but it's definitely spreading. We have the yellow states are agriculture and nuisance problems reported. Notice California doesn't have any. They, aren't, they haven't been found on farms in California at all, which is very surprising, but not really considering how slow they move and how much they like urban areas. So they're in urban areas in these counties, although now in Oregon, Washington, and other states around um, around the red states, you've, you'll see they're starting to become an uh, agricultural problem, not a severe one yet, and a nuisance. Looking at California, they started off in Los Angeles County. They were identified in 2006. People asked me how they got there. And obviously, someone went to Pennsylvania or to Virginia with a trailer and came back. They must have left the window open. This actually happened in 2006. Somebody from back east from Pennsylvania, had a trailer, brought it over here, and then looked inside and there was this thousands of sink bugs. Called the right person, the agricultural commissioner, they came and sprayed and killed them. Although I don't know for sure that this wasn't how the infestation started, because <laughs> that's probably about the time they got here um, in Sacramento. So they, they, got, they, they were in first in Sacramento beyond Los Angeles County, and then they've moved up and down from there um, kind of recently found in San Jose down there, in Chico. They're all over Chico now. Um, and most recently they were found in Kern County, which growers there are very nervous about. Um, so they're definitely spreading, but this is years. And then once they even get to the county, it takes years to get to agriculture. Uh, this is one method. So they, they, they hitchhike on cars, especially. They hitchhike on trains light rail. Um, uh, a lot of times where we find them are where people commute to Sacramento. Um, so they definitely they leave their car out during the late summer and fall. Stink bugs are looking for crevices. They go in the car, drive home, they go out of the car. Farmers markets, I don't know how they haven't reached farms because these farmers markets are right in the middle of, of the infestation areas, right under trees. <laughs> Not necessarily the most um, host uh, susceptible species, but they're there. 
and they will spread. Uh, these are some infestations, just a few that I've taken pictures of. 13th and P, there's a, a building near here, uh, and 14th and H, there's a, a, a lot with a bunch of Tree of Heaven trees, and um, somebody who I was communicating with took this picture, it was great, and then I was called, I get called to a lot of infestation sites, and, and I have to try to identify, it's easy to do, between brown marmitted and other stink bugs, and, and over there near the corner of Fair Oaks and Howe, Sure enough, those trees on the right, the big trees, tree of heaven, uh, and then other trees, and they're all over the place. Um, Ethan G, across from the county uh, uh, administration building, of uh, these bricks that so you like to get in those spaces between the bricks, and then looking up into the white area on the alcove there, that's the picture on the lower right. Uh, this was after spraying with some pyrethroids. There were still some there, but there were thousands of them. Uh, as you might expect, a couple of years ago. This is what, so I've been following, I was on the news a lot, I was quoted in the paper, radio and everything. Um, and um, so people, so we have a survey online that I tell people about. If you find them in other areas where they're not currently established, then uh, let me know. And people have gotten used to knowing, that, to contact me, because I have this, these maps online on our website, um, which I showed at the beginning, and I, I don't have another, uh, I'll tell you at the end. Uh, in January, uh, this was six months, five months after they were found in the uh, downtown, midtown area. So there were three locations, and two in Citrus Heights and one south of Sacramento. Then a year later, of course, they've spread, they've been found, these are individual finds. And now we look at January 1, 2016, and we see that we have these other little circles appearing, um, and these are reproducing populations. And you can bet there are more reproducing populations than these, but these are the ones that I've been able to identify. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and down in Elk Grove, seven. And we're just going to keep filtering out where we'll have one big red blotch over the whole area before too long. Uh, but again, they're kind of slow and moving. <clears throat> they are an arboreal species, which means they like trees. That's their preference, unlike other stink bugs that like the overwinter in weeds and, and debris on the ground. These overwinter in trees, and they feed mostly in trees. And if you pull the bark back on them, you can find them. In um, March 2014, this was when they were starting to come out, but I could still find them in the lower left picture, just pulling back a big piece of bark. You can find them. You can find them now. Um, but now that it's warm, they're starting to come out, even now. Um, they get between the downspouts. They really like the crevices in the house and the outside, too. Just call me Marco Rubio. <laughs> I'm getting the water. Uh, stone fruits, they like. These are some of the host plants that are crops. They love peaches. Peaches are the big problem, the biggest problem. Palm fruits, apples and pears, they love them. Berries. Grapes actually are not that big of a host, not that important. Then you get into the vegetables. They like eggplants, tomatoes, okra, pepper. They love corn. Corn's kind of like peaches, uh, beans. Sunflowers. Okay, I'll be showing you some sunflower pictures. Amazing how many can show up. You can see the fava bean in the upper right, the damage that they caused. You can see them on the tomatoes on the bottom. Uh, they, they just, they build up in such huge numbers that they become really problematic. These are some of the ornamentals that they're hosts of, and I've seen them here a lot on butterfly bushes, catalpa. And the ones that are underlined are like the major house where you'll always find them at the right time of year. Fruiting mulberry, of course, fruit early, and you can well, we definitely find them on that. Um, I don't know what a princess tree is. I've never seen one. I don't know if we have them here. Um, red bud, not so much. Zelkova, yes, we've got some Zelkovas, which are our street trees out here. But uh, these are the four, the big ones, the, the maples in general. 
transient maple is, has low branching, so we see they're easy to find them on uh, because uh, with a ladder, you can see my assistant getting a ladder, we're counting them. Uh, the one on, the picture on the lower right is, is after, after um, we beat the branch onto a beating tray. It's, it's an entomology thing. You set the tray under there, it's cloth. And uh, uh, this was after it took me a little while to get the camera out to take the picture. But you can see there's probably 30 that are still there. They just love those fruits um, that you can see. They, the, uh, they're like the helicopters, you know, that come down, um, the, seed, the seed pods are. And you can see the lower left, the, the tree is called trident maple because the leaf looks like a trident. And then you can see some, an egg mass and nymphs there. They feed on the trunks. They go right through the trunk. And I'll show you much more of that. Last leaf privet. Privet is a hedge, often trimmed. Once it's trimmed, you don't get the flowers, you don't get the fruit. But if you don't hedge them, then they develop these fruit clusters. And uh, brown marmorated stink bugs absolutely love them. Chinese pistache. We have a lot of Chinese pistache uh, trees, uh, especially near where they were found at the rail, uh, uh, light rail station on 13th near R. Um, uh, you can see in the lower right picture the uh, egg mass now that I was taking a picture of. So they're, they're visible if you know now what you're looking at. And you see them starting in about June all the way through September. Tree of Heaven. That, uh, a lot of people don't know what these are, but we have them, especially along the railroad tracks. Um, that nationwide is the most important tree species. Um, definitely, um, they love Tree of Heaven. They're a weed. It's a weed invasive species. This is how they feed. Uh, they, they put their, in the right picture, you can see the proboscis is what they, is the feeding apparatus. That proboscis is over half the length of their body. So they're five eighths of an inch long. I neglected to say that. So the, uh, the proboscis there is over halfway into that. It's actually a Brussels sprouts uh, leaf stem. Okay, um, which I didn't think they would feed on that, but I got a good shot of them. Uh, you can see them on the apples. <clears throat> these are all from back east. I'll show you uh, shots from Sacramento. And these are from Sacramento. This is uh, damage on peach. This is what they do. You will not have any peaches if you have brown marmorated stink bugs near your, your house unless you cover the tree or spray. You wouldn't want to spray home peach. Apricot, you can't see it very well, but the discoloration is caused from the sting. Um, nectarine, Asian pears just get absolutely deformed. Apples, Asian pears, pears, and then the figs. And then plum is one that actually I, I never saw them on, right next to peach trees all season long, two years in a row, never saw a single damaged plum. And now I understand they're not on the list. And other people have found out too that they're not much of a host. So plant plums and pullouts if you're going to plant anything. Uh, persimmons. <laughs> I was following in the Fremont Community Garden at 14th and Q. I was following the persimmon tree in 2014 because I thought I heard they were a host. Um, and I didn't see any. But I stopped looking in August. Well, they do their damage in September. And uh, so in 2015, I, I definitely was following them. And whoa, there's some damage <laughs> on two different trees that I was looking at, two different areas, same thing. And the one on the upper right must have been damaged somehow because you wouldn't normally see a persimmon without its skin. <laughs> Apples, great shot, huh? <laughs> uh, and as I was, I was taking several pictures, and with each succeeding picture, there were fewer and fewer stink bugs in the picture. Uh, they, was, they start to move out of the way. As soon as you approach them, they're moving out of the way try not to be seen. And here's the damage you can see on the, on the apples on the right. Um, they, they, they pee. Um, so you can see their excrement all over the fruit. And then we were seeing this trunk feeding, which I had heard about but never saw it until I really started looking for it. Um, they're feeding right into trunks and branches. And this is a cherry tree. And they were, 
all over it. I don't know how they're not causing some kind of damage or maybe even transmitting a disease, but it's during the summer, so it's not all wet, but still a lot of injuries, and I don't know if it's going to hurt the tree, but it didn't seem to slow it down. Same thing on an orange tree, feeding on the orange. You can see on the right, the oozing. Uh, they were feeding on an orange, but they don't really like citrus so much, as much, unless there's some sort of cut in it and this had a cut. And then this was only a block or two from here, this shamal ash in the back of some condos near uh, Tenth and P or so. Uh, is this person here by any chance? Because work, she worked for the state too. Anyway, uh, that's a lot of sink bugs <laughs> feeding on that trunk. And even crepe myrtle. They were feeding on a single crepe myrtle tree. It's not like they're all over it, but crepe myrtles have those fruits on them, those clusters. So uh, they, they like them, but not too severely. And then the Zelkovas, this is just a block from here. These pictures were taken on um, these street trees, the ones with the jagged leaves you can see on the right there. Um, they, they like the leaves, but they especially in, in sep uh, late August and September, they feed on the trunk. They're trying to stay cool, and they can get a lot of sap that's cool from the tree. Comes right up the xylem cells in the wood, and then it's, it's fresh out of the ground. It's cool. Uh, so that's how they stay cool and get fed. But that's uh, there's, there's some population there. Okay, uh, probably not as much interest to this group, but they are a problem in orchards and back east. Again, they had millions of dollars damaged in 2010, but not so much since then because the growers started spraying a lot. So fruit crops are a major house. They overwinter in the dead trees and homes, sheds, bins, stack logs, and boards. All stages are found in the orchard by mid-season and uh, stages of nymphs and adults and eggs. Uh, the greatest damage is on the edges, so they're in the forest, and they have forests that are largely over there. They're largely tree of heaven. So, of course, they're going to then migrate into the orchards, and the edges are always the worst. Um, and then adjacent susceptible crops, they'll migrate, migrate in from those. And the harvest of nearby crops that have them may force the migration then into neighboring crops too. And late season crops are generally have the most potential for the greatest damage. Except in peaches, anything, any ripening time, they'll be nailed. And these are peaches. This is what happened in 2010. They lost all their fruit. I mean, huge, huge amount of damage. <clears throat> and they don't, they don't have the, the orchard size that we do here. And they're also bordered by forests, and we're not so much in the Central Valley, at least. So maybe the damage won't quite be as bad. One never knows. But there's a lot of concern. Oops. And grapes, growers are concerned because they taint the wine. They make an off flavor in the wine. And they penetrate the, the grape berries so that um, they'll cause rot. Rot organisms will get in there. Okay. So it's definitely a concern. And then they get in the wineries. And that's a big concern to wineries to also. So the avenues of potential economic impact in vineyards, direct injury to grapes, as I mentioned, introduction of rots and other pathogens, and then aborted berries and necrosis, dead, they just kind of dry up. Um, and then, of course, contamination of the wine at harvest, at crush, um, and then nuisance in the wine tasting rooms. Potential problem, but again, they're not as interested in the grapes as there are peaches or other crops. So will they be a problematic in California vineyards? This is a slide I showed show to grape growers when I'm giving this talk. Um, grape is not the, a preferred host. It's mainly going to be an edge effect, and that's what they find back east also, is that the edges are most affected. Uh, where they may be the worst are small blocks where they have a large area to edge ratio, I'm sorry, a small area to edge ratio or a large edge to area ratio. In other words, the edge is bigger uh, relative to the area in a smaller vineyard. Now, those bordered by forests or susceptible crops and species have, are at risk. 
the harvest of nearby infested crops. Uh, later varieties, especially those that ripen later in September and October. Um, and mechanical harvest is worse than hand-picked. And back east, where they have the problem, they are hand-picking and, and shaking out, trying to get the stink bugs out when they're picking, which is not an easy thing to do, but they, they kind of have to. Uh, so they get in the grapes. And they, they'll make it then to the wine, which causes a problem. But here we mechanically harvest mostly, so it's not like you can inspect clusters. So in the wine, all the instars, that is the young and the mature adults, have a, a distinct odor that can taint the wine. It smells like fresh cilantro, at least the smell of a stink bug if you crush it or hold it up to your nose. Kind of like cilantro, and I hate cilantro <laughs> in, in excess. Um, other descriptors include skunky and citrusy and piney taste. Not the kind of thing you normally want to advertise on the bottle that you have more of that, that flavor. So it definitely, there's been research that I'm not presenting here uh, in Oregon and in Maryland that show that yes, especially when you, especially pressing, the harder the press, the more it presses out the juices, the uh, flavors. Um, and uh, and, and uh, when you ferment with the must, with the uh, crushed berries, then it's going to be more of a problem then too. Now, um, moving on to buildings, which you're all mostly interested in. They have an aggregation season. This is in Pennsylvania. We don't have them to this level. There was probably a cornfield or soybean field or a peach orchard nearby, and they harvested, disturbed them, they moved over. But this is fairly common in, in those mid-Atlantic mid states. Uh, it's just, and they're studying now, the, the research, because some houses get it and some don't. Um, so they're looking at color of the house and material that the house is made of. Um, haven't heard of the results yet. But large numbers, there's thousands on the house. And on the lower right picture, you can see they're sweeping them into a bucket. There are so many, and you can see them all over the side of the house still. Large, large numbers of these things. And this is right in the picture on the upper left, you don't see that there was a lure that they were attracted to. It's not like they just were congregating in that kind of high density. But they can. Entrance into buildings, these are pictures around here, uh, a few blocks from here. And they'll get into these older homes. You can see on the upper left the attic vent. If you don't have a screen behind that keeping them out, they will be in the attic in October, especially when it cools down. Um, they come in air conditioner vents. Um, the, the old windows that open like this that have a little gap that they can get into. Um, any kind of little hole in the house or hole in the building, they, they will get in. So of course, the, the sealing those entry points is going to be key. Uh, you can see uh, um, on the left where they get into those windows. Uh, on the right, upper right is where they are uh, congregating, where the opening is, because it's not a sealed entrance. And then this is lower right is a, the back of a restaurant near here, a very good restaurant. And they, they called me complaining about stink bugs in their offices on top. Um, but uh, they weren't in the restaurant below. But they probably were last year, and um, this was a couple years ago. And I've told them, you kind of need to close those windows. <laughs> There's no screen there. You can't because they open like this. Um, so they, they have to deal with that. Um, and I've had other restaurants call me and say, what am I supposed to do with them? Because I go in there and they're all over the walls. Has anybody been into a restaurant and they're on the walls or on the floor? Because they try to keep them cleaned off. But I've gone into midtown restaurants and they're all over the place. Not something you really want to see when you're in a restaurant. Apartment managers call me because they say their tenants are threatening to move out because of all the stink bugs. What do they do about it? It's a matter of sealing the entrances. But they're attracted to light, so anytime you go in the door at night and the light's on, just like mosquitoes, they're going to come in. 
this is an attic in the, uh, in the back in the East States, and uh, they, they built up in large numbers. He counted 24,000 of them. And he, this was a researcher. 20, he got them all, counted every single one of them, 24,000. <laughs> That's a lot of stink bugs in the attic. So stink bugs are different than other overwintering pests, and there are other pests that get into our homes, including other stink bugs, but the brown marmorids are different. They enter earlier and they leave later than many other pests. They're active throughout the entire winter, um, active indoors, but they're not feeding. They're just, when there's lights, they'll come down and try to um, be near the light. So a certain answer would be turn off all your lights, but you know, we like to enjoy the indoors. Uh, they get into clothes, they get into sheets, drawers, papers, beds. Anybody ever found them in, in hiding in some of these? Okay. Yeah. They are active at night. They are attracted to lights. They're problematic in sensitive environments, including hospitals, restaurants, regulated facilities, and so on, especially the older buildings. But indoors, bear in mind, pesticide-wise, people always want to control them with something. They don't bite. They don't feed on anything indoors. And they don't lay eggs. They're just a nuisance. So uh, back off of the pesticides. <laughs> so I try, we all try to tell people that. So this was a study done. I call it a screening study because it's screening insecticides, but it also is done on screens. <laughs> you can see these screens hanging on that clothesline there. And they, they, they're really attracted to screens. In fact, some of the trap methodology uses screens as a way of attracting them in addition to the lures. So they, they impregnated, they just sprayed on different products on these screens and replicated, replicated study. Um, and see, these are some of, so this is this guy, Tom Kuhar, a researcher at Virginia Tech. Um, these are some of the products that he tested and, these, uh, and they're being used by pest management professionals. I don't know if you know the names of these, maybe it doesn't really matter, but they're largely pyrethroids. You probably heard that term. And neonicotinoids. Maybe you probably heard that term. Imidacloprid there on the right is the insecticide used on the back of dog and cat necks for flea control. It's the most widely sold insecticide in the world. It's fairly safe, unless you're a bee. <laughs> and that's where part of the problem has originated. But there's a lot of controversy about how much effect that's really having. Um, on, the, on the bees. But regardless, it's being used. Um, so the nine insecticides labeled for pest management professionals to apply, they expose them to ambient conditions. You saw the clothesline with the screens. And then mortality was assessed after 48 hours of continuous exposure to full days. Now the screen application appeared to be an effective delivery method and then you're not spraying your, your whole house. You, know, you can just spray the screens. Um, so these are some of the products that lasted um, 44 or 30 days. Uh, and they are pyrethroids and neonicotinoids. And combinations often work well, too. I'm not an advocate at all for using pesticides, but I know a lot of people just want to get rid of them and want to spray something. Pest control companies are spraying the entrance points on the outside of the house. Some people are trying to fog the inside of their house. It doesn't work. Um, other people are trying to just spray rain or something. It doesn't work. It's not worth putting that inside the house or outside the house because then rains come and wash it off into our streams. So these are some slides from a presentation. I went, I go to this Brown Marmorid Stink Bug Working Group. Uh, they have meetings back in Virginia and Maryland. And this is one from June 2015 from a company, uh, Cooper Pest Solutions. Just a few slides from him. So these are some of the entry points you know. Wherever there's a crevice, they'll get in. Uh, in they treat the interior of the attics uh, mainly. Uh, so, in, well, on the interior, whenever there's interior, it's going to be attic. They don't treat inside homes. Nobody should be treating inside homes. Have I said that already? Yes. <laughs> um, no treat wherever they could possibly get in. So what are they treating with? They use 
pyrethroids, uh, the ones that work well. Um, uh, another one, uh, another one, pyrethrins are organic. They're organically acceptable. Uh, organic growers would be inclined to use pyrethrins as opposed to synthetic pyrethrins, which are called pyrethroids. The pyrethrins are made from chrysanthemum flowers. They're completely natural. But they're also broad spectrum. They kill a lot of things, including bees. Um, okay. And they're, they're, they did surveys from these two especially bad years, 10 and 11, and they found that um, 81 percent were generally pleased with the results. Some were wow and then some were good, 81 percent. Of course, this is their own survey. They may have asked the question with a leading, you know, leading the responder. Um, anyway, people, so they, they, these insecticide applications can work, and you're expecting the residual uh, that's left on the surface when the, the bugs walk across that to kill them, that's the goal. Um, generally, we say that it doesn't last that long, it doesn't do that much good, but this company is saying they do get good results, but they don't like doing it. Um, in 2014, um, this is 2014, service, 2014 service calls, uh, August um, uh, 15th, mid-August mid through September, they had 315 jobs that they went out and sprayed. September 1st to May 30th, they had 11 calls. So that period where they're going inside, the populations are high, they're going indoors is when they get those. Um, timing is a problem. It's all concentrated in those uh, month and a half period. 45 days at the most to get the work done, and they're going up and down ladders, tiring. They don't like doing it, but of course, there's some money to be made in it. Um, Pyrethroid label has changed for, for the brown worm and stink bug. All outdoor applications are limited to spot or crack crev and crevice treatments only, except for uh, treatment of vegetation around the structure, applications to lawn, turf, and other vegetation, and the applications to the foundations, up to three feet away from the foundations. So uh, back to what we can do. There's a lot of, there are a lot of indoor stink bug trap manufacturers. And these are examples on the left. Um, I don't know that you usually find that many, but if you have a real big problem, yes, you could. It's just a light with a sticky, uh, sticky su uh, surface on the outside of it. This one in the middle, the indoor stink bug trap, the original indoor stink bug trap. Uh, I'm sure the next one will be new and improved stink bug trap. This one. Um, probably doesn't work all that well, but you can see it has a base and then there's a, a bowl and a light shines through and there's a liquid that has somewhat of an attractant in it. I'm not sure what the upper right one, how it attracts them, but maybe there's a lure or something down there that pulls them in. And then the one on the right looks like a, a lava lamp, uh, but it is a bona fide trap. So there was some research done. Virginia Tech, they did some good research of all these different trapping methods, and they found the best one was homemade. It attracted the most, killed the most, and it's very simple. It's just a, a casserole pan, uh, it could be a dish, uh, where you shine a light down into it. Of course, brown marmer and stink bugs are attracted to light. It's soapy water. Once they hit that soapy water, they can't get out, they're dead, or they die quickly. All right? So that's what we recommend. Of course, you'd want to keep them out of your house and building from the start. So you normally would seal the entrances with caulking or whatever it takes to seal your entrances. But once they're inside, this works pretty well. So um, one of the county supervisors, who will go unnamed, but it's a she, uh, had them all over the walls in the seventh and each county administration building of her office. And um, the pest control company called me and I told them about this method of using a light to shine down into the pans of water. We tried it. Um, there's a soap being applied in there and the pest control company came and put the light in. They didn't have a desk lamp that shines down into the, the pan, which would have been better, but it worked. And you can see there's a, a cord 
coming down for the electricity for the light that's up there. Uh, not ideal, but it worked. And then they also sealed, there's a, there's a hole in the wall where they could, on the outside, they got in. So they sealed that up so they don't have as big a problem anymore. But yeah, so it's a, it's a local problem. It's, it's pretty bad. Okay, let me talk about traps and the work that I did in Sacramento. Uh, this is um, a group of traps produced by the company AgBio. Uh, they have traps and lures. Um, you can see the grower one on the left, grower model, four feet tall, research back east. We've done a lot of research on this. They had a $10 million grant from the USDA um, for, for years of study, five years of study, which is just now ending this year. Uh, <clears throat> so that's a, it's a $30 trap. And, and because brown marmorated stink bugs are, are arboreal, they like tree trunks. So they, it was found that the tallest, darkest um, um, structure works best for attracting them. They land on the tree trunk, or the, the pyramid here, and then walk up to the, the trap, to the, where the lure is. The one in the middle is smaller, professional, it's a little cheaper. The homeowner model is smaller still at $17. And they're starting to paint those all black, not yellow. And you can see in the upper right a trap that was put out in September 2013, catching a lot of them. Rescue also makes a, a, a bullet, a rocket trap that some of you may have seen works okay. So the lures, and this is probably more detailed than you ever want to know, but there are pheromone and synergist lures, two lures. USDA developed the lure, um, which is the same, nearly the same as the harlequin bug pheromone. So last year we had a lot of different kinds of stink bugs. One was a harlequin bug. We had leaf-footed bugs. We had all kinds. Oh, I'm also going to pass around what some of these look like so um, you can take a look at them. Let me do that now. Collection of different bugs that we have found. Okay, and then the synergist they developed, which um, it enhances the catch in the traps, okay? And they have to be used in combination. And these are what they look like. Um, this is the ag bio lure, upper right, then um, the rescue lures, and there's two of them. Um, you'd think they could figure out how to combine them, and in the lower left, Trace is a, is a trap and lure company, has combined them into this little wafer thing that, um, <clears throat> I should have brought some lures, I didn't. Because uh, they, they, you can smell the, it, they smell like a stink bug. Uh, they combined it, and we call this a beef jerky lure because it looks just like beef jerky. Uh, and notice on the picture on the lower right, the stink bugs aggregate, not aggregate, but the, um, they, you can find them outside the trap just as much as inside the trap. In fact, there was a study done because there was a claim by a, a company that makes traps that if you put this trap in your garden, you'll eliminate or greatly reduce damage. <clears throat> Sounds great, huh? So this, this researcher did a replicated study and put a trap in the garden next to plants, and then he put, he put no trap in other gardens, so like 13 replications each. What did he find? Wherever there was a trap, there was more damage because the bugs come to the area and feed right within two meters, six feet of the trap, and they're feeding. They're not necessarily going in the trap until maybe later. So more damage with the trap. So if you're going to put a trap out, don't put it right in your garden. Move it away at least six feet. <laughs> okay, this, um, so there were different places where I found really high populations in the traps. This is one near 13th and P on the left. It's an area that has shrubs, and then these tall trees are maples. Japanese maples, but they're maples nonetheless. Upper right, cherry tree near 13th and Q. Um, this one on the lower right, I saw as I was coming this way about a block and a half from here. Uh, and you can see the trap there, kind of in the middle on the left. It's a black tall structure. Again, here. There's our trap there. Our trap was 
up in the tree here, and we had a chop. You can't see over here. In 2014, I had 10 traps out. And what you can see are the number on the left is the adults, number on the right are the nymphs. And if you look at this guy right here, that is a lot of nymphs. So we, in general, we caught more nymphs than, not here, than adults um, most of, much of the time. Uh, but look, if you just go a few blocks away, maybe eight blocks away, very few in the traps. Traps are not very efficient, but when the population is really high around here, they will catch them, mostly later in the season. Uh, but that's, that's a lot. This one here is this guy on the left. That's where we caught them most. Don't know why. Again, the maples, they're coming, they walk up and down the trees. All right, so this year, 2015, uh, I, I wanted to test putting traps in the tree, so I, I compared 10 traps of this kind, the tall pyramid trap, to the double cone. You can see there's a whole entrance on this side, and there's one on the other side also. It's a double cone trap, a one gallon, just put up in the tree with the lures in it, okay? And now this is the same shot as the 2014. There's more traps, but now we have pyramid are in the red, and the yellow are the hanging traps. <clears throat> I tried to pair them up to some extent, but we had a few problems. When you have no circle around it, less than 100 for the whole season per trap. And this is where there were uh, 100 to 300, and then more than 300 with a dark circle. Again, they're mostly in this area, maybe allow out a little too, but you get beyond that area and you have very few still. This is years after they started getting established. So, um, so big population, and here we are where uh, ninth and Q over here. So we're, you know, it's pretty high population here, um, but not as high as right there. And then pyramid dirt versus double cone, you all wouldn't be so interested in this, but overall there were 14% more in the pyramid traps, and the adults especially didn't seem to want to go into the double cone traps quite as much. So this is the average per trap. About 100 uh, nymphs were caught on average in each trap, meaning some had many hundreds. In 2014, one of the traps, on one of the pictures I showed there, uh, one week, 250 nymphs in it, and that took a long time to count from, and we separated the nymphs by age, too. So there was a lot in that one. <clears throat> okay, through the season, this was 2014, we wanted to know this peak. You know, is, there, is this really a peak? And is this another peak over here? Well, it looks like it to me. So I put the traps out March 12th, came back five days later, and there were already stink bugs in some of them. Obviously, I didn't get out early enough, so in 2015, I did. <coughs> and you can see the adults here go at, uh, along at a pretty low level until September, when they're one, one or two times, these are weekly sampling, and this is the number of stink bugs per trap per day, because it wasn't always every seven days that we checked them. Anyway, the first eggs were laid May 5th, which is actually the earliest in the country, because I communicate with other researchers. And so May 5th, earliest in 2014. And then the, um, according, there's a model that was developed back east where they, they I used it and predicted July 11th we'd get the first eggs of the second generation. Um, and, and, and then this is, this is the peak of those. Well, let's see. Here's the first eggs, and here's the second eggs being laid here, and that would be Oh, you don't see my finger, do you? Uh, <laughs> okay, let's hang on. So this is then, the eggs were laid here, the nymphs are starting to develop, and then the, the most up here. Okay, this 2015, I had seven traps that had more than 100 per season. You, got, you saw the same peak in June, and then you had a peak in September. And look at the adults. Very few adults, all season, then all of a sudden, bam, September, a lot of adults. 
first eggs were found April 14. Now that was definitely the earliest in the country. That's relatively unheard of. So congratulations, Sacramento. <laughs> uh, and uh, then the ratio of males to females, the ratio of nymphs to adults, if you look at the circles, male and female, we caught more males than females. I'm sure you're all just fascinated with that. And then uh, we caught more nymphs than adults both years, and a three to one ratio and then a four to one ratio. Not sure why, because many other places in the country, it's just the reverse. So in addition to monitoring <coughs> the Sacramento population, I monitored the Sacramento Delta area. This was a grant from the Pear Advisory Board. So the pear growers obviously are very nervous about this. So they wanted me to put traps all up and down. So there were 21 traps. And I didn't find any in 2014. And then in 2015, there was one male on the last check date caught in Freeport at the golf course there, because we target places that, that people visit a lot, including where people live, uh, in, live down here and work in Sacramento, or they have agritourism or farmer's markets down here. So uh, we did find one, so they're on the move slowly, and maybe in another three or four years, they might make it to some farms down here. OK, I did a, a study in the Fremont Community Garden uh, looking at uh, sunflowers and sorghum and planted them in a ring around three plots, 10 by 20 plots, on April 14th. Uh, we found large numbers of stink bugs uh, on sunflowers and far few on sorghum. The reason we did this because back east, they are doing trap crop studies where uh, since the stink bugs fly in, and before they reach the crop, maybe they could stop and feed on the sunflowers and you could spray the sunflowers and still have an organic farm, potentially, or at least fewer stink bugs on the farm. So we tried it. Of course, it's a small garden. It doesn't really, can't really do a lot with that research-wise, but it was just of interest. Uh, I did this with Charlie Pickett, who, is, uh, who works for the Department of Food and Agriculture. He studies stink bugs statewide. Um, and uh, so they're easy to see on sunflowers. OK, so here's the garden. And these are the three plots here. And you can see over here is the other part of the ring. And it goes all the way around. And here it is in June. And they're growing up. You can see mostly sunflowers, not very many sorghum. Not many stink bugs were on sorghum, but <clears throat> we found them on sunflowers, especially on these real tall ones here, OK? We didn't plant these. We, the gardeners didn't want us to plant tall ones. They didn't want so much shade, so we planted medium-sized ones, four to five feet. And then we also planted some baby dwarfs and found absolutely none on those. Large numbers on the tall sunflowers, huge numbers on the tall sunflowers. And here is what they look like. That's a lot of stink bugs on that sunflower on the left. And that was just one little foot, one 12-inch section. You can see them feeding on the sunflower on the right. And then even late in the season, they're still feeding on the sunflowers in large numbers. So it definitely attracted them. And here is a graph. We did counting. So we were counting in, on June 5th, June 8th, June 11th. And we killed them as we counted them. And then this first generation of nymphs comes along in mid-June. Uh, <clears throat> from the eggs that were laid a little bit before that. Um, and we get 500. And we didn't kill them as we counted them because it would have taken too long. And, and then you start to kill them, they get scared away. So we just counted and found up to 500. And then, eat, and then um, UC and CDFA came by to collect some for their, for their uh, populations that they have in the lab. So they wanted some live. Stink bugs, so we let them collect them. And then the, the population started to uh, go down. But you see 190 adults were count collected here and 10 nymphs, 94 and 19, 170 and 57. There's a lot of stink bugs out there. So we found that, uh, let's see, there's a summary slide, uh, that uh, the stink bugs definitely are attracted to sunflower. Does this mean, and notice the, the red line down at the bottom? That's what was on tomatoes. We were kind of doing a little comparison. 
it's hard to count them on tomatoes that are thick because you get in there and you try to pull the branches apart and then they, they move or drop. You can't count them. But anyway, we didn't find very many on the tomatoes where last year they did. It's certainly no proof that it works, um, but um, not at all. In fact. <laughs> you can't do this and, and show any kind of proof. It's just interest that we did it, okay? And we got some interest. Um, the growers, I'll just talk a little about chemicals. The growers, um, when they spray, and they spray peaches back east um, 12 to 13 times every year for them. It's a lot of sprays with harsh, with pyrethroids and neonicotinoids. And the, the sprays tend to not work very well. The bugs on some of these products become moribund, which means they become paralyzed and look like they're dead. And then a couple of days later, the legs start to move, and they walk right back up in the trees and start feeding again. Um, there is movement in and out, so it's hard to, to use chemicals on them. Um, and then there's a buildup of secondary pests. This is what growers don't want to have to do is spray insecticides so often because it kills the beneficial insects, so other pests become a problem. Um, so they, they did this study where they sprayed the sides of, of jars with insecticide, let it dry, and then gave them four and a half hours of exposure on the dry residue. Um, and came up with this lethality index, index and we see some of the most, most, the most lethal are up at the upper left, dimethylate, malathion, bifentral, bifentrin, which is a pyrethroid, uh, a lot of these products. And then you get to the lower right, and you have uh, products that generally don't work very well as far as just being lethal for them to walk on the dry residue. All right, these are those, those top 10 from that list. And those are some of the products. They include organophosphates, OP, pyrethroids, organochlorines, carbamates, and pyreth... Uh, uh, yeah. Um, again, this is just in the lab. Field results don't, aren't the same. And so what they find is um, they get some products give good control. Other products stop the feeding. They don't kill them, but they actually stop them from feeding for seven or more days. So these are the products that they're often using. Uh, in, in rotation with other products. 10 to 12 weekly applications, alternate row to try to save some spray. Um, late May through harvest, pyrethroids and neonicotinoids. <coughs> they wouldn't have a crop if they didn't. Um, the infective insecticides in the lab were only 60% average mortality in the field when they applied them in early, late early July. <laughs> no, sorry, that's a mis... Uh, I think it's late July. So they apply it in July, they get 60% kill. They apply it in August, they get 40% kill. In September, 20%. These things don't work all that well, so that's why they have to spray so frequently. Um, these are some of the products that are being recommended by Virginia, West Virginia, and Maryland Cooperative Extensions. Um, Pyrethroids, neonicotinoids, carbonates, and mixtures. So there are definitely people studying alternative control methods, including just applying to the border, the edges, um, with residual products. Works actually pretty well. So then they can use organic or IPM in the interior. They're using trap cropping like we studied. Um, there are some organic insecticides, and these are the ones that can have some effects, especially pyrethrum. But they're not that effective, especially on the adults. So if you are a homeowner and you want to spray pyrethrum or something on your garden, pyrethrum is probably the best mixed with soap, you know, a little mixture of pyrethrum and soap. And, uh, and that'll kill some of the nymphs, but not the adults. Now this question of natural enemies, we've seen a lot of natural enemies killing stink bugs. And we see this, especially this one called the digger wasp. And here it is taking uh, it's a wasp, but it's not a parasitoid like most wasps are. It's a predator. So it kills the stink bug and drags it down into its hole on the lower left. And this is what they look like. They're almost an inch long. And then we also see a lot of jumping spiders in the traps and eating, and then another one there. And various, we saw assassin bugs, um, ground beetles on the right there, um, and lady beetles. 
I'm sorry, not major deals, permanent managers. Now, this is good news for everybody. Not so good if you're a researcher and you're looking for funding, but there is potential for biocontrol actually killing these guys and making them be a non-issue in Sacramento and elsewhere. There is a parasitoid in China called Trisolcus. It's a genus name, Trisolcus japonicus, uh, which makes you think it would be from Japan, but it's actually from China, Trisolcus japonicus. It's an egg parasitoid. It lays its eggs in the eggs of brown marmorated stink bugs, like it's doing in the lower, right, lower left picture. So it is, it's been brought back from China. It's under study in four sites, including UC Riverside in, in, throughout the country. Uh, and they are doing um, testing to see if the, it will lay its eggs and kill other species besides just the brown marmorated stink bug. And it does, it sounds. <clears throat> but the brown marmorated stink bug is preferred. So there's a board who's going to decide at one point if this will actually get released. And it all depends on the risk. If it's killing other insects, it might not get released. But it prefers brown marmorated stink bug, and the value of, of killing all the stink bugs would be great, uh, brown marmorated stink bugs. So anyway, the possible release could be in 2017. So look for possibly con some control in a couple of years. And there's widespread feeling that this um, parasitoid is going to be really, really effective. Um, so much so that in China, I mentioned it's a pest. Not that much of a pest, kind of like some of our other stink bugs here. So there is hope, um, especially when you consider that in 2014, they put these egg traps, these cardboard um, pieces with egg masses on them. They put them on trees out in the, in the forest just to see what's feeding on them. Well, lo and behold, they found one egg mass was parasitized almost 100% by Trisulcus japonicus. Now, how it got out in the field, and because it's only in the labs, uh, but they did some genetic testing and found that it's not the same DNA. So it was brought over just like the brown marmorated stink bugs. Somebody accidentally brought it over. We have it here in the back east. Last year it was found in Vancouver, Washington in a park. They did the same thing. So it's spreading too. And I think there's a good chance that it might end up in California, especially if someone finds them in Ashland and then they cross the border and you can't transfer them from state to state. But if they're in California, you can certainly spread them. Uh, not that I'm advertising that, but that uh, eventually they're going to make their way here. Okay, yeah. and that little guy is painted. It's not an actual stink. Well, it's an actual stink bug. Um, so, I'm, so this, um, this the website at the bottom is where I have a lot of my information on brown marmorated stink bugs, including a, a lot of results, a lot of pictures. CESacramento.ucanr.edu, but the stop. BMSB.org is a national uh, state bug website. Lots of great information on that, too. And then, of course, if you want control information, the ucipm.ucdavis.edu. And at this point, I will open it up for questions. Anything? So if you have a question, I'll bring the microphone, and this is the people on, um, online can hear your question as well. And if you're online and you have a question, you can type it in the chat bar. You mentioned some insects that predate stink bugs, these brown marmonated, marmonated stink bugs. Are there any other, like birds or other animals that predate on them? Yes, birds, we've seen them feeding on them. But they're called stink bug for a reason, and birds don't like the taste. Uh, so they will try it. We saw them snatching them off the sunflower leaves, but not very many of them. <laughs> they don't prefer them. And one taste, and I think that's going to be it. Uh, chickens will feed on some, but not many. Um, that's about it on the non-insect species. Um, <clears throat> they're just not that effective. And we have predation and parasitism going on here, but they're just not, um, obviously, not controlling the population that well. 
Other questions? Hi, um, thank you for your talk. My name is Melanie Day. I work over on 9th and Q, and so if you need any live samples, just come to my cubicle, my desk by my mouse and keyboard. Um, so I've got two questions. Um, one is you mentioned that the distinct bug um, populates host plants here that they don't populate in other areas because we have different species, some different species at least here in California. So I was wondering if there is any, if there's been any studies on um, impacts on native plants or native trees here that, that they've been causing any adverse impacts on them. I know you mentioned sunflowers and there are native sunflowers here as well. Right. Good question. We, there are native sunflowers. They will feed on them. They don't seem to stop them from reproducing. I don't know. They might put an additional stress on them because you're taking some of the sap out of them. <clears throat> but they, they grow. They produce seed. It doesn't seem to hurt them. With the trees and shrubs, they're feeding mostly on the fruits. But they do feed on the trunk. And when they do feed on the trunk, like that ash tree especially, I can't imagine that there's not going to be some detrimental effect to year after year of that feeding. But so far, we haven't really seen it. Um, back east, they, they've seen it on peach. But they haven't really seen that it's doing that much damage. So on our native species, it's going to be mostly the fruits. But even when it's the trunk, it doesn't seem to be that big of an issue. Thank you. And my second question was, um, you mentioned that they um, populate the tree of heaven. And I know that that species, um, I was out on a project one time at the Antioch Dunes. It's a fish and wildlife refuge um, for the Ling's metal mark butterfly. And we were pulling tree of heaven. So it just made me think, if there were stink bugs out there, is there any um, evidence of any adverse impacts it might have on other, other invertebrates, including the endangered lynx metal mark butterfly? I don't think there will be any adverse impact on any other insect at all. Uh, they don't feed on them. Uh, some other stink bugs will feed on, on various insects, but these don't. They, they're maybe out competing trunk sites <laughs> uh, and fruit sites, but no impact that I can see. They don't even transmit diseases back east to other to, to plants. So, so they could be worse than they are uh, in what they do. Um, but if you want to look for them to see if you have them in your area or in other areas, that would be the first place to go. Would be Tree of Heaven and Chinese pistache and privet. And, and that's what I tell the growers down in the Delta: look on those trees in, in August and September. If you don't find them there, and, and they're hard to find if you have a really low population, but they're probably not in the area if you don't find them there. There's another question back here, I think. OK. Any other questions? <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.